Hello and welcome to the National Oceanography Centre's Into the Blue podcast. I'm your host Will and today I'm joined by Dr Izzy Yo to discuss the hidden dangers of underwater volcanoes and other marine geohazards. Welcome Izzy, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. So are you, in, in previous episodes you usually talked about career history but I'm actually going to switch it up today. So I'm going to ask you a random science slash ocean question. Okay. So what my question is, what is your favourite science fiction film? Oh, my favourite science fiction film. I think I would go for Alien, probably, or Aliens. Maybe the second yeah. one. The second one's the okay. better one, isn't it? Yeah, the second one. Um, is, uh... But I like the like the unseen danger and the space stuff. I yeah. always think movies which have a vision of the future in are quite interesting. Yeah. Like the claustrophobic. Yeah, like I, yeah. I really like movies that are set sort of now from the past when right. when there's like a vision of what, what the future will yeah. look like and it's like complete How different nonsense. It is to now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I, I like that and I, I like just the like subtle threat the whole way through yeah. as well. So Yeah, no, it's a great yeah. great franchise as well. <laughs> it's a solid yeah. franchise, although the recent so, ones less so So we'll get into the main discussion. So marine geohazards. Do you want to just give us an intro about what marine geohazards are, maybe a couple of examples and then maybe a bit also about how we at the knock and how others sort of study them. Yeah, sure. So um Usually when we talk about marine geohazards, we mean anything that can happen in the ocean that's a danger. Um, so that could be um, a natural event or something uh, triggered by humans. Normally, for the research that we do, we focus mostly on natural events, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. So those are things that happen uh, just due to normal earth processes or atmospheric processes or whatever. Um, and there's a huge range of them. I mean, we generalise marine geohazards, but there's the full basic diversity of any hazard you could have on land just in the ocean yeah. and having uh, those those things occur in the sea can can generate other hazards as well so for example when you have like a, a major earthquake underwater you often generate a tsunami um, and there's been a couple of examples of, of those kind of relationships where uh, you've had an event that occurs underwater and the the impact that it has on land is a secondary thing so for example there was the um, 1883 Krakatoa eruption yeah uh, that was a, a big volcanic eruption triggered a tsunami in Indonesia that killed tens of thousands of people wow. Um, and then also, uh, more, maybe a bit more relevant to the UK, there was quite a major underwater landslide called the Storega slide. It's actually a series, it's more than one right. um, slide, but this is like 8,000 years ago off like the Norwegian continental shelf. Um, and that generated a tsunami that, that hit the UK as well. So right. um, yeah, there's lots of things that go on underwater that we don't necessarily see or monitor, but which do present a hazard to, to land as well. Yeah. Um, so I suppose that's what we, we mean when we say marine geohazard uh, in this context, but yeah. it can be quite a broad range of things. Yeah. So how do, how do we study them? So how do we find out whether these things are happening underwater or... or... Well, it's a whole mix of different things. Um, sometimes we don't realise they're happening underwater until um, we see the impacts of one. Um, so sometimes the research that we do is following up on something that's already happened. So we know, for example, if there's been a tsunami um, and then we can go and trace what the cause of that was. Um, we have quite a lot of monitoring systems for some um, underwater, well, I mean, global processes. So, for example, seismicity, so earthquakes. Um, yeah. We have like global monitoring networks for those. Um, other things we don't monitor nearly as well. So things like submarine volcanoes, really, really hard to monitor. It's not really electricity underwater. So putting any equipment into those places is quite difficult. You can do some monitoring from space. So we use satellites quite a lot to observe the oceans, right. to observe um, sort of what's going on on the surface, but see what was really hard to see through. Yeah. Um, uh, especially like deep sea water, right? You get below a few tens of meters, yeah. and you haven't got a clue what's going <laughs> on. Um, so that can be really, really difficult and quite challenging. And that's actually one of the, the things that, that Knox starting to look into is how we monitor the deep ocean. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure I'll get so on to that. I guess it's, it's something that, so I come back, so it's obviously something that, you know, we, it's quite hard to predict if something like this happens. Is that right? Like, a, like you said, we, I can only really study it once something has happened. Yeah. Obviously, we can... there's, are there area, there's obviously areas of the ocean and the planet that, is stuff like this happens a lot more regularly yeah so there are there are definitely regions on the planet that are more tectonically active so yeah. we have plate tectonics yeah. um, on earth uh, so we've got um, a load of different plates that are moving around moving next to each other away from each other towards each other those boundaries tend to be really uh, seismically active so loads of earthquakes and volcanoes there um but things like submarine landslides can occur all over the place so there's no real a geographical constraint on those other than you need some kind of input of material that can slide and a slope yeah. for it to slide down um, and they can be triggered by all different processes as well right so for some hazards they're quite sort of uh, geographically constrained but others can occur anywhere right um yeah and the, the method the methods that we use like they evolved a lot over time or are there some that you know were used 
a long time ago that are still sort of useful today or is it does it obviously move with technology but uh, so some of them are sort of the same systems. They've just improved. So right. earthquake monitoring we've been doing for a long right. time. It used to be like a scratchy pencil on a spring. Right. Um, and now they're obviously digital and, and they communicate with each other and you get the data in real time rather than having to go and look at a printout. Yeah. Um, and then there's other technology that's being developed all the time that's really, really good. So we've started to see things like cabled observatories for volcanoes. Right. So putting in lots of different sensors to measure different parts of volcanic systems. So not just whether or not there are earthquakes, but also... Uh, what's going on within them so what what gases are coming out of them how are those changing how's the temperature changing um how are um the sort of where is magma in that system and how's it moving around and so we're getting much much better at doing that kind of thing but again it's really really challenging to do in the deep ocean because all of those sensors those high-tech digital sensors need powering and they also need some kind of connection to land right if you want to get the data in real time so if you want to do any kind of like useful monitoring yeah you want to know if something's going to erupt you need that data like now, not in three years' yeah. time when you go and pick up the instrument. Yeah. So we deploy a lot of stuff at Knock that we put on the bottom of the sea right. and leave there. Yeah. And it will record and record and record for ages. Okay. And then we go and pick it up and we look and we see yeah. like processes in, in that have happened. But when you're doing monitoring, you want it in real time. So you need a connection to land and you also need power. And so putting those kind of systems in the deep ocean, like far away from land mass, is really, really difficult. Yeah. So maybe so in in it was December twenty twenty one almost it sort of started. So you, the hunger volcano yeah so uh hunger tonga hunger harpai but we're actually going for hunger volcano now we've, yeah. we've got it down <laughs> so what is, the, what is the full what's the full name of it? so it, it? hunger tonga hunger harpai are the two islands so right. most of the volcano uh, hunger volcano lies underwater right and before the eruption it last erupted before 2021 in 2014 2015 right and it had like two separate islands that were sticking up out of the water, one of which was called Hunga Tonga and one which was called Hunga Harpai. So it's right. the name of the two islands was used right, as okay. the name of the volcano. But we we'll stick with Hunga. Hunga Volcano yeah. now, <laughs> yeah, which is the actual name yeah. of the volcano rather than the Yeah, islands. so you want to tell us a bit more about what happened and, and the, the eruption itself? Yeah, so uh, Hunga Volcano lies in uh, the southeast Pacific, uh, just off about sort of 50 kilometers away from, from Tonga. And this is a, a plate boundary, like we mentioned earlier. So there's one plate that's going underneath another one there. Yeah. Um, so you get a lot of volcanoes. You also get a lot of seismic activity. Tonga's quite a hazardous place, actually. It has quite a lot of, of different marine geohazards that impact yeah. its shores. Um, and this volcano, it's fairly active. The whole That whole section, of, we call it an arc, uh, that whole volcanic arc, it's very active. It's had a lot of eruptions. I think it's been four in the last five wow. years. So we see eruptions there all yeah. the time. Uh, but most of the time, they're quite small. Um, so... You know, we have, we talk about VI, Volcanic Explosivity Index, which is hard to say. <laughs> so we'll go for VI yeah. uh, quite a bit. And that's a gauge of how explosive an eruption is and how much stuff's come out of the volcano. Right. Um, and usually uh, the eruptions that we see, like most eruptions, aren't very high on that scale. They're maybe a one, two or three. And those can still have really significant impacts. But on the whole, they're not going to have like a global impact like yeah. like this eruption did. And that's how this eruption started. So we'd had quite a few um, eruptions over the last few years. We'd seen them, they, they were quite small. Um, some, like little bits of ash, small explosions. You get explosions when you mix um, hot rocks and water, obviously. Right. Like if you imagine like dropping something really, really hot into yeah. s- some cold water, you're going to get like a sort yeah, of flash steam to steam. And, yeah, 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 exactly. So interaction with water can make those eruptions more explosive. Right. But even in those scenarios, like you weren't, generating big waves you were you were making like smallish explosions relatively small ash columns you weren't seeing too much impact um on tongan shorelines some of them make make these things called pumice rafts uh, which are like big rafts of floating volcanic rock right. they can be quite a pain because um you don't really want to be sailing your boat through one and they're quite hard to predict where they're going to go so right. we rely on things like ocean models uh, for that and if you don't have a, a good ocean model for that area, or actually, even if you do, it's still hard to predict where they're going. So that can be a hazard associated yeah. with those. But it's not, you know, it's not too, it's nothing compared to the, the hunger volcanic eruption. Yeah. So that, that eruption started small. And I think maybe we have got a bit used to those eruptions always being quite small. So in December, it was doing pretty classic volcanic erupting for that, that area. It's a pretty, like, pretty normal. Yeah. Like, like, you know, people were going out on boats to go and look at it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, and it's a, it's a spectacle. Like, I don't I don't blame them. <laughs> although not putting in a recommendation for, not the best idea, <laughs> for sailing yeah. near to volcan- like volcanoes that are erupting. Probably yeah. don't do that. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, it was it was relatively small um, eruptions, a bit of water interaction, some explosions, very, very small, like a few centimetre waves were being created. 
uh, by that phase of the eruption. And that went on for like a couple of weeks. Um, and then it sort of stopped for a little bit. We had like a little hiatus. And then uh, I think it was January the 15th, it was evening time um, in Tonga when it happened about five o'clock. Right. There was a really big, huge explosion. Um, now the day before, activity had ramped up a little bit, but it'd still been, I mean, it was it was the most activity we'd seen. So it was more explosive than it had been. But not but, anything to suggest. Yeah, that... but there was like really no clue that, yeah. that this huge explosion was coming. Um, and yeah, it, it really, really blew up. There was at least two major explosions. Wow. It ejected, well, the estimates are still in the air a little bit, yeah. but somewhere between five and seven kilometers probably cubed of material. Wow. It's a lot of rock. Um, it threw up into the air. The eruption column went up into, I think it was 58 kilometers was the top of it, which is like one of the biggest right. uh, eruption columns we've ever seen. You can see it obviously from space and from satellites. You can monitor yeah. that. We emitted loads of gas. Um, we threw ash really, really high up and that rained down on some of the islands in Tonga. And the thing that ended up being most devastating about this eruption uh, was that, it, that that explosive phase and some of the processes associated with that afterwards generated tsunamis. Um, and not just in Tonga. So the worst tsunamis, the biggest ones, uh, we call it run-up, so how big the waves were. Right. They were largest in the Tongan Islands. Some of those exceeded 10 metres. I think some of the wow. really biggest ones were maybe nearly 20 metres, yeah. which is a big wave. But also the pressure wave from the eruption, so the actual explosion itself, created this pressure wave that went round the, the, the earth, like, I think four times they measured it and it created waves in other oceans as well so right. there were tsunamis in oceans that weren't the pacific but yeah. related to that volcanic eruption i actually think knock has a tidal gauge somewhere in scotland that detected it really? uh, not not big like a, right. just, just like a very very small so this, wave this but... is not just tonga then this is across the whole world no yes yeah, yeah it really was a, a real global event and it's it's the biggest eruption we've seen in the 21st century i mean biggest is a bit of a, a vague word certainly yeah. the most explosive we've seen right. for a long time so it's pretty major then in terms of when you compare it to some of the more sort of well-known volca volcanic eruptions like yeah it was a, it was a huge event yeah. um you know uh it's been compared to pinatubo in 1991 right. that was probably the most famous one right. that, that it's been compared to it's yeah. a similar sort of size to that yeah. maybe a bit more explosive similar volume of material right uh, so yeah it was really really big um and you know in, in many ways, it could have been worse than it was. People did lose their lives uh, because of the waves, but Tonga had had quite a successful education program mm. um, around uh, tsunamogenic risk because they're also at risk of earthquakes and other things. Um, yeah. And it happened in the evening and the people were aware of the eruption as well. So there was a, an initial smaller wave and most people evacuated. So most regions had managed to evacuate before the largest waves hit the islands. Um, so there wasn't a huge loss of life, which was you know good, good. like yeah. obviously any deaths are always a tragedy but it could have been much much worse than it was but it did have quite significant impacts on, on, on property and coastal infrastructure yeah um, and that kind of thing so we're still so obviously that was over a year ago now are we still seeing like human impacts today like are we still having seeing yeah we are the people of tonga and across the world um so Tonga is obviously quite an isolated place. So rebuilding, restructuring, all of that takes a long time. They have to ship everything in. But the other thing that this eruption did um, that was in some ways useful for science, but not useful for people, is um, it triggered um, what we call pyroclastic flows. So um, a pyroclastic flow is, is a sort of usually caused by a collapse of, of a part of the edifice or part of the ash column. Right. So it's, it's basically volcanic rocks falling downwards. Um, and usually right. on land they, they flow down like a flow yeah here uh, we think what we had in the initial phases is um collapse of the ash column vertically into the ocean and that triggered um density driven flows underwater these flows are incredibly fast and really really big yeah um, so they flowed down the sides of the volcano and they um damaged subsea cable infrastructure so telecommunications right. cables that support internet and like telephone links um, and so Tonga has two cables, one that connects the islands uh, together, so they, they can talk to each other, and then one that connects Tonga to the rest of the world. And these flows severed both of those cables or damaged both of those cables right. to the extent that they, they couldn't be used anymore. Right. So you had a major disaster then, um, and then the internet stopped. So, you, you know, this was a time where they yeah. needed aid and, and relief, and it was really, really hard to make contact. Yeah. Um, they managed to fix the international cable quite quickly. Um, you know, cable networks on the whole are very resilient and we have cable repair ships. Uh, Tonga's quite isolated, but these eruptions damaged such a length of the cable that actually it was quite difficult to, to repair. 
and the the cable that connects the islands themselves is still not being repaired completely so wow. some of those islands still don't really have proper telecommunications yeah. uh, connections even more than a year after the eruption right so yeah, that doesn't scare people enough losing the, the internet <laughs> no. it's, it's such a weird thing to think about that something that happens on the water can affect so much above above the water and the yeah. internet and like you never really think about that at no all. you don't think about it and as i say like the the telecommunications network is is very resilient and as the uk we have a lot of connections we have loads and yeah. loads of cables so for us um damage to one of those cables wouldn't switch off our internet we might see slightly slower loading times yeah. maybe or an advert wouldn't load like not, it, really, it would, not a be, proper impact it like would that. probably be less of yeah. an impact for us but when you're a, a small isolated island yeah and you're reliant on just one or two cables, damage to those can really, really impact Completely communities. Yeah. yeah, Communicating with people off, off the island is... Yeah, and it's like the last thing you need, right? So you yeah. just had a major volcanic eruption yeah. and all of a sudden you can't even contact, can't contact. people. So yeah. there was, you know, they couldn't contact people on, on islands to the north. There was a really distressing period right after the eruption where one of the islands was just emitting a distress beacon. But they, they didn't know what happened. They couldn't communicate right. with any of the people there. Basically, this island had almost been completely overwatched yeah. by the wave. It's um, so scary, isn't it? Yeah, it was, it was horrible. Yeah. So there was this sort of like ghostly beacon. Um, eventually, uh, New Zealand really and, and Australia and global aid um, did fly, like they flew yeah. planes over to right. sort of assess what the damage was and yeah. see, see how bad it had been. Um, but until that, those, those activities, really the rest of the world had no idea what had happened there at yeah. all. Wow. So weird to think about, isn't it, that that can completely cut off a whole island from communicating it's yeah it's terrible really isn't it it is yeah it's really terrible and it's it's always surprising because i think um we always think that you're like we, we know everything that's going on that you can you know you can go into google earth or whatever and, and look at something yeah. and like we we can track each other on our mobile phones yeah but once you get somewhere remote and particularly within the oceans like that just doesn't happen so yeah. there's so much stuff going on in the oceans yeah. that we actually don't know about yeah and um, yeah they're a real frontier so in terms of the ocean then, did have we seen any knock-on effects of this volcano on the ocean itself, on the surrounding areas? And is there anything that's occurred as a result of this volcano? And anything in terms of climate change as well, like does that have any effect on these these events at all? So big volcanic eruptions can have impacts on the climate. Um, right. Definitely. This one emitted quite a lot of... of um, gas into the atmosphere and so that can have like periods of, of cooling or, or potentially warming usually cooling and we have seen that with eruptions in the past um, those changes tend to be relatively small for really really major volcanic eruptions and I'm talking like huge VEIs here things like Yellowstone yeah. or whatever uh, those can have really really major climatic impacts um, you do see small climatic changes due to, to big volcanic eruptions yeah. but uh, like if you were to compare them to to human caused climate yeah. change like it, it's pretty minor one of the interesting interactions between the climate and, and marine geohazards though is um because we're getting sea level rise and um, so for these tsunamis a lot of uh, infrastructure was you know just a few centimeters above uh, where it where it would have been hit by a wave otherwise yeah. so if it had been a few centimeters lower and um, that would have been there would have been more damage associated with with the tsunamis caused and so as we we see climate change and we see um sea level rising uh those waves are higher up and they they potentially can can reach infrastructure that they previously couldn't um, and you don't just see this with tsunamis you see it with things like storm surges you see yeah. it with uh, and, and the frequency of storm surges as well uh so there are lots of of interesting um interactions between climate and, and natural hazards that aren't necessarily immediately apparent right okay well that's great so we do actually have a, we have actually recently recorded an episode on storm surge which should be available by the time this episode's out so if you do want to learn more about storm surge then head over to that um should we finish a bit on what's coming up for you so any projects you're working on now that you know you can tease or have a yeah so talk about obviously we are continuing to work on on the hunger volcano eruption um, and marine geohazards in general. We're doing quite a lot of work looking at, at how we protect uh, infrastructure from marine geohazards. We've published some reports and stuff already um, that are available. Um, we work quite a lot with partners around the world. So the, the research that we, we're doing now, this isn't just a UK effort, this is a global right. effort. And we're working alongside uh, the Tongan Geological uh, Survey Services and um, partners in yeah, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, etc. So There's quite a lot of, of, of global 
collaboration going on to start understanding these systems a bit better. So that's something that, that we're really focused on at the moment is looking at, at what the subsurface of these, these volcanoes looks like. Right. So what is the magma chamber structure that's feeding these eruptions? Um, and then the other thing that, that's a real focus for us at the moment um, within, I'd say, the whole of my group, which is the, the Marine Geosystems Group, um, is, is monitoring the seafloor. So how do we start to overcome some of this stuff where it's right. so difficult to understand what's going on? It's so difficult to monitor. Like, what kind of sensors can, can we use? What already exists that we can use? There's some really interesting uh, work currently going on looking at whether or not you can use seafloor cables um, to, to measure things like, like earthquakes. Uh, right. So whether they can actually be used to detect seismicity rather than just being damaged by it. Yeah. Um, so that's really, really useful because they obviously go right across the oceans. So if you can start using that network to monitor the seafloor, you get a lot of information, right. um, which is really, really exciting. And we do a lot of sensor development and stuff here as well. So yeah. that's all happening. Too. I'm looking forward to seeing how that develops. Yeah. But yeah, thank you for joining me today, Z. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about the hunger volcano eruption or the Knox work with marine geohazards in general, Head over to our website, noc.ac.uk, or follow any of the links in the description. To make sure you don't miss out on future podcast episodes, make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app, so make sure you don't miss out. We'll see you on the next episode.